Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, my guest is Mark Ungewitter from Charter Trust, joining us from New England. Uh, we'll talk about the market environment, overall the breadth conditions, how they really evolved. We're going to focus on breadth today uh, and because I think in the last 48 hours, you've seen sort of a, a, a tale of two markets. You've seen the market rally on limited breadth and then the market rally on stronger breadth. We'll look at how that relates to the long-term picture and how it's evolving. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a very rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together through the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, quantitative methods, investor psychology, whatever we can to make sense of these trends, quantify what investors are thinking, and most importantly, how they're voting with their capital. And the essence of trend following is really focusing on the trends and how they're evolving and one of the ways you can do that is by focusing on the breadth characteristics, right? Price is number one importance, as we've talked about many times, followed by breadth, followed by sentiment. That's sort of my own uh, design of how to, how to put those in, in priority order. And breadth is an important component because price tells you one thing. We can see that the S&P is retesting the upper end of that range from 3,200 to 3,600. We're just above 3,500 as of the close uh, today. So the question is, what are the breadth characteristics? What types of stocks, what types of movements can we, uh, can we use to qualify that movement and, and draw an expectation about the potential for further upside or further downside? We're going to dig into that and, and much more today. We have a great guest today, Mark Ungewitter. He's been on the, on the show a couple times this year at somewhat pivotal times in January and then again in June. So I'm very interested to hear what he's thinking right now. Uh, Next week on the uh, on the tenth on Tuesday we have Brian Shannon from Alpha Trends who's going to talk to us about anchored VWAP, which is an indicator he designed that we've uh, that we've added into the uh, the stock charts ACP platform. On Thursday the twelfth we have Craig Johnson, uh, the technical analyst at Piper Jaffrey. Uh, I've, uh, I've known Craig for a number of years uh, and followed his work closely when we were, I was on the institutional buy side. So I'll be very interested to hear what he is telling his clients right about now. And then next week. As a preview on the 17th, we have Jesse Felder. As a reminder, we also have a lot of really good, uh, fantastic even uh, year-end content that we're working up, some year-end review type of stuff, some, some, uh, some work to really look at, the, uh, at this year from a lot of different angles and focus on the charts. So a lot of really good content coming up, uh, coming in uh, November and into December for sure. So keep an eye, uh, an eye out for, uh, for the future content on Stock Charts TV. Let's get to our market recap. As I mentioned, it was further strength today. We really had strength yesterday. This was coming out of the, uh, you know, the, the election, uh, election night to, uh, to the day after experience, continuing to you know, navigate this uncertain period where we don't really have a clear winner yet in the presidential elections and the congressional elections. It's uh, you know, continuing to evolve real time as we analyze these markets. But you know, the market doesn't hit the pause button when the, when, when the uh, news is uncertain. It just sort of continues. And what you can see here is a vote of confidence in the equity markets by the fact that we've seen an expansion uh, in, in reapproaching new highs. Let's recap just what's happened and we'll dig into some of the big picture themes. Well, again, we're going to focus on breadth, I think, with, with my guest Mark uh, Ungerwitter and then also uh, with, uh, with a segment focused on breadth later. The S&P finishing up around 2%, just about 3510, uh, with a nice gap out of the open and sort of, uh, you know, traded around that range for much of the day. Uh, the Nasdaq 100 up a little more, about 2.5%, mid caps and small caps led the way uh, higher. So it's an interesting follow through day. We had the big move higher yesterday, continuing to move up today, but now a much broader advance. And we'll see what the breadth characteristics pretty supportive. The VIX now back below uh, 30. Looking at some other asset classes, bonds essentially finished uh, flat, traded up a little bit, uh, really going in the second half of the day, but overall finishing about flat uh, and 10 year yields uh, up just a bit. The dollar uh, lower and this weaker dollar theme has certainly played out. The UUP is down uh, about 1% today. And that chart of the dollar, uh, which had been looking as a like a very constructive chart 
uh, leading higher, really showing some weakness. And I think that weaker dollar theme is something uh, that if you haven't really thought through that scenario and what that might mean, uh, maybe worth doing so. And precious metals up pretty strongly today with gold up over 2%, silver up over 6%. Uh, oil down a little bit and energy was the was the worst of the 11 S&P sectors. All 11 were in the positive for most of the day, but energy uh, actually finished a little lower. Uh, healthcare next to the bottom. Healthcare was a was a dramatic winner yesterday with uh, Biogen ripping higher a lot of biotechs and other other uh, groups within uh, healthcare doing very well. A little, little more back to earth today with uh, with Biogen back down pretty significantly, but uh, the XLV essentially finishing up a quarter of a percent. What really led the way today materials, technology, uh, number one and number two. And the materials is an interesting one because materials and industrials, which is sort of the, you know, kind of infrastructure plays, reopening the economy sorts of, uh, sorts of themes, were both down on the bottom yesterday. It was really a narrow technology focused and, and communication services focused rally yesterday. That's why we focused on the, the FANG trade or the fan meg stocks. We sort of went through all of those uh, at the end of the at the end of the show yesterday, uh, you know, it was back to a, a little of everything rallying today with financials up there, uh, along with those uh, with those other sectors. Let's look at a chart of the S and P just finished where we see where we finished up here. So we've talked about this range from thirty two hundred to thirty six hundred, and that you know first was established back here, sort of in the month of September, and as we traded back up there, it sort of seemed like a really clear range, and that range has now been further validated by secondary highs up in that thirty five fifty range and a secondary low now in the thirty two fifty range. So. You know, if you didn't believe in the idea of this range until now, I, I think you have to be a believer at this point. What's interesting now is we're nearing that upper end of the range. And the question for many is, is this the, you know, the next leg higher? Is this a, you know, a consolidation pattern? And then this is a midway point of sorts before we break to, you know, further, further upside. Is this, you know, again, we're nearing the, uh, the option B, we're nearing the upper end of this range. And you and you are exhausted with this uptrend, or the tr uptrend is exhausted, and you you continue to mean revert and uh, and trade around there. I think looking at breadth is one way to try to qualify that and see you know what are the probabilities you would assign to a breakout versus a a, a bit of a further consolidation here. You know, again, from an anecdotal perspective, there are so many potential headwinds and tailwinds. Uh, you know, I think what the market is doing with this significant rally over the last. A uh, couple trading days. Really, it, it was going into uh, the election day that you saw the big big rally on Tuesday. Uh, but continuing uh, further, it's sort of seeing this, you know, potential Biden victory with a with a mixed Congress as being, uh, you know, maybe more stability but less potential for a very progressive agenda that could be, uh, you know, less business friendly or perceived that way. Uh, it seems like that is what is sort of being priced in now. It's 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 this was the nightmare scenario we were all worried about. And it's actually turning out to be a pretty positive trend for stocks. The question, you know, the open question for me is, is there enough to break above? And as we've talked about before, I think when you have a range bound market, you respect the range until that range is broken. And one of one of two things happens at some point, we break above 3,600, we break below 3,200. I would argue the momentum is most likely going to continue in that direction of that, of that breakout. We'll have to see uh, how things play out from here. Looking at some other uh, quick themes very quickly, uh, you know, the number one group you can see is in uh, renewable energy equipment. This is like solar stocks, um, hydrogen names are all uh, within this group. You can see up pretty good. This is a group that's actually done pretty well. There's some mid-cap names in there that have done uh, especially well and are ranked in the, on the upper end of that uh, mid-cap scooter rankings that we have. Uh, but interesting to see that the number one uh, group today, followed by, you know, three of the top 10 are within uh, the materials sector. Airlines is actually a notable participant in the top 10 groups up over 5% today with gambling stocks as well. It's things like LVS and MGM and others that uh, I think many have sort of uh, written off. These are sort of the, uh, you know, things are getting better play that, that are doing, uh, doing well there. Uh, automobiles, that's Tesla as well as the traditional automakers. Semiconductors, talk about a fantastic uh, break to the upside. Let's look at that chart. We'll look at the SMH, which is one of the uh, semiconductor ETFs. Making a new 52 week high today. Now, that on its own is pretty impressive. Uh, what is not a surprise, I think, is just this trend, this, this consistent outperformance of semiconductors, the strong price performance, but also the relative line that just continues to go higher. I think that's one of the themes. One of the charts in our um, Mindful Investor Live chart list is just the relative strength of semiconductors, because I found when that group tends to do well, uh, you know, the market tends to be in pretty good shape. When it struggles, 
uh, you know, the, the market tends to, to be having some difficulty. You can see that the breakout is pretty good. The run in the last couple of days is good. And it's, you know, similar to the rest of technology doing, uh, doing well. It's sort of along with that theme. But making a new 52-week high, that is just the latest in a series of higher highs and, uh, and higher lows. So I think it's worth, uh, you know, continue to pay attention. That's, that's a trade that has worked. I, I see that continuing most likely. Uh, you know, a trend in motion tends to stay in motion is, I guess, the way you would anecdotally say that. So certainly worth uh, paying attention to uh, to the to that group. On the downside, you'll see things like tobacco names. And again, on a day when sort of everything's up, it's worth noting what is not participating. Same as a, a day when everything's down, it's worth noting uh, what's sort of holding up because that can be telling. Um, you know, groups in the bottom 10, you have biotechs and these were up pretty big yesterday. So it's not unreasonable. You've had a bit of a, of a pullback today. And Biogen was down significantly, probably 10% or so. I don't know where it closed, but you know, down a pretty good, uh, pretty good clip after being up significantly uh, yesterday. A lot of oil stocks in here, so you see equipment and services, E and P names, uh, and again, essentially flat uh, when everything else was uh, was up. Tobacco. So within consumer staples, there's not a lot to get excited about, to be honest. And if you look at the chart of tobacco stocks, lower highs and lower lows. That's not a pattern I would be preferring. I'd much rather something like semiconductors making higher highs and higher lows and defense stocks within industrials. Industrials as a sector is okay, but defense stocks actually uh, struggle a little bit. If you know your candle patterns, you can see the little uh, preview uh, that's called a dark cloud cover, which the name is probably less relevant than the fact that, you know, you had an up day yesterday, a down day, which finished at least 50% of the way down yesterday's range. Um, so it's suggesting short-term dif- distribution. Finally, pharmaceuticals, which, you know, the rest of healthcare are up pretty good. And you can see a couple of those uh, groups actually struggling a little bit uh, today. That's our market recap for today. Again, a lot of different themes as we, you know, digest the uncertainty of the elections. And again, it's a great time to focus on the charts, what is happening and what is working. Let's take a quick commercial break. Back with my guest, Mark Ungwitter. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together and review the charts and, uh, and what signals we can tease out. And we'd love to hear from you, particularly questions that are coming up in your normal process of analyzing, uh, analyzing markets, analyzing tickers. Uh, a couple ways to get a question to us. Number one, via email. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is our email. Uh, second is on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. Or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video. We're going to do another mailbag segment at the end of this week on Friday's show. We'd love to answer one of your questions on the air. I want to welcome on my guest uh, back to the show today, Mark Ungewitter from Chartered Trust. Mark is joining us from New Hampshire. He's been on the show a couple times so far this year at pretty pivotal moments. So, Mark, welcome back. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, hearing your take on things. Oh, Great to be here, David. Thanks. So we've talked, uh, and again, you were, you were here last in June, sort of early mid-June. I remember your comments about breadth and, and really focusing on some long-term constructive patterns, which, you know, so far credit to you have played out beautifully uh, since, since you uh, were on, uh, on the show last. Give us an update of where you're at, particularly you've got a, another chart showing us a long-term S&P read here. Right. Uh, this, this chart is, uh, every chart is stale right now because this, this chart is from Friday, uh, month end, end of week. And I, I thought I'd, uh, it's, it's, you've, been, you've been talking about, um, you know, the, the bullish percent index. There are many ways to view this, but I, I thought I would highlight this. Uh, in June, in, in late May and June, um, about the time we talked, we, we, had, a, we had a massive um, thrust in the market. There are local thrusts, and then there are, there are, are historic thrusts that, that probably occur every three, four years. So we had that in June, whether measured by Walter Deemer's breakaway momentum, whether measured by the McCullen oscillator um, or other approaches. Um, and so and that got us that got us bullish. Uh, it, you know, we had built some defensive, um, made some defensive uh, allocations um, on the way up because we large we, we essentially missed the, the February top. 
we didn't want to sell into panic, so we we sold on the way up, and then and you know then we then we bought back, uh, paid a little insurance to do that. Uh, but this this chart uh, does illustrate um, our thinking. Um, we, we, what we try to do is we try to label uh, cyclical bottoms, um, and that th those are those uh, blue squares or boxes. Uh, and we, we labeled those uh, with with a deep trough in a longer term thrust in a longer term breadth, like a you know, like a uh, two a, a participation relative to 200 day average. Mm -hmm. And then when we get a, and then when we get one of these these major thrusts, um, we, we have a new cyclical advance. And and we we think that happened um, at, at the March bottom, putting us uh, six months into we didn't know until late May early early June. Uh, you know, depending on the approach, uh, but uh, so we're six months in. So, and and the key to this chart is that, it, that what that does is provide some context. Like like everyone, we're, you know, we're we're working with a you know kind of limited tools of you know price, breadth, relative strength, cyclicality, and as you mentioned, sentiment. We probably put a little more emphasis on the cyclicality. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that does is give us it gives us context. Um, so our context was to going into the end of the week last week was to expect kind of one of these shallower uh, breadth troughs that you see after the cyclical bottoms, which are the blue boxes. And you know that ha that has played out. We were kind of oversold, you know, consistent with an early cycle bottom. Um, and beyond that, we were using the 200-day average because after the cyclical bot as a, as a uh, fail safe, if you will. Um, because as you as you can see that you know it's common for uh, price to, to to come back to this is a forty week average mm -hmm. um, after a cyclical bottom. It's very interesting. So overall, I mean, it's setting up that uh, just to to reiterate, right? That early March or that that March low is sort of an uh, an early cycle bottom, suggesting that we're we're sort of uh, you know in a continued uptrend from here. It seems like. I think that would be the presumption. So we'd have to ask, what well, you know, what would be a failure? And you're actually where your where your cursor was. You you can kind of see that the, the range you were talking about. You know, this is this is a weekly close, but you can see that 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 uh, what will probably and I say probably be a consolidation. But what would make us wrong about this? Well, again, a fail safe with the with the with the 200 day average, and then also we note that that after a thrust, um, it's very rare to come back through the level. Uh, the price level where the thrust uh, um, was recorded, and and mm -hmm. that depending you know depending on which one you use, um, uh, that could be as low as uh, thirty fifty, which is a long way down. But we're asset allocators, you know, we're we're really not trying to, uh, you know, we're trying to capture as much of 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 a, of a, a cyclical move as we can, but not not worried as much about the uh, the shorter term swing moves. So given that, we only have about a minute left, Mark. I mean, given that, I mean, and, and where we're at, obviously with uncertain elections, but thinking between now and year end, which, you know, seasonally, you mentioned the cyclical pattern, seasonally, November, December tend to be, you know, pretty, pretty good for stocks overall. Um, are, you know, is this, this rally that we're getting this week, is this something that you would be inclined to lean into and expect further strength going into year end? Or is it more caution thinking we're at the upper end of this range and you need to tap the brakes a little bit? How are you interpreting well, this? A little bit of both, you know, because yeah. of the context, we think, it, we think it's going to resolve to the upside. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, you know it, it's bound to head fake. You know, so I'll, I'll say, I'll go out on a limb and say a head fake um, and, and then a breakout. But in the, in the bigger picture, uh, the average of these rallies sh should take us toward uh, 3,800, between 3,700 and 3,900. Um, so that could easily happen next year. Got it. Mark, this is so helpful. And I, and I really, what I appreciate the most is this long-term perspective. It's so easy in a week like this to get caught up in the flickering ticks. And this is a great, you know, long-term perspective thinking about the trends in the market. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Hope you and your family stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Take care, Dave. That's Mark Ungewitter joining us from uh, Charter Trust. And again, I really like having him on the show. He has a great, just very calm and, and peaceful way of thinking about the long-term trends. And, and in a week when it feels like things are absolutely nutso with headlines and uncertainty and potential directions, it's great to just take a step back and think about the trends and how they've evolved and how they uh, you know, potentially are going uh, to be moving going forward.
Let's move on to our next segment called banking on breath. So, you know, Mark's comments really focus on some of the breath characteristics, how that helps you identify some of the, the cycle lows. Uh, and breath is obviously one of the things we've talked about on the, on the show regularly. You know, as I mentioned, we've got that sort of three pronged approach to macro analysis, starting with price, which I would argue is always most important. And then thinking breath and then thinking sentiment is sort of the priority order. I would think of it. Uh, and that means breadth is an important way. It is your first, you know, first tool to try and qualify what you're seeing with breadth or, the, or with, with price. The market is doing X. What can the breadth tell me about participation? That's really what breadth is designed to tell you. Tell me about participation of the underlying stocks or names that make up this index that I'm trying to analyze. So we're going to go through a breadth uh, list that I, that I use, a chart list that I have. We're going to get through as many of these as I can. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of analysis, all of these charts are part of the morning coffee routine chart list or chart pack that is built into your stock charts account. Go to the member dashboard, go to um, the chart list at the very bottom. You'll see a little link for chart packs and you'll see my, uh, my uh, chart list on there. You're welcome to install it and use any of these charts as much as you like. We're going to start with breadth by cap tiers. This is usually the way we look at, the uh, first way we look at breadth and it's looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange, for the S&Ps, so large caps, mid caps, small caps. And, you know, my guest yesterday, uh, we were talking about um, uh, Frank Capillary from Instant that we were talking about the uh, cumulative advanced decline lines. He was using this one, which is the advanced decline line in the S&P. And if that's how you look at it, it is absolutely supportive. You have the market holding up, you know, making, uh, trying to make a new swing high. And you have the cumulative advanced decline line that uh, broke above its peak here from early September uh, there in early October. And now it's pulled back and tested the 200, excuse me, the 50 day moving average and tested its, uh, its breakout level and potentially resolving back to the upside. It's actually pretty positive suggesting that, uh, you know, the market's in decent shape and should continue higher. What's, what's caused me to be less optimistic, I guess, is the fact that that breakout and, uh, and confirmation has not been validated by the New York Stock Exchange cumulative advanced decline. I was looking at a much broader universe, including a lot of mid caps and even small cap names, which is uh, the small cap breadth is what you see here at the bottom. You can see that both of those have not yet confirmed a breakout above their October uh, high or their August high. So if and when you get a breakout above those level, I could see a scenario where the S&P reaches 3,600 if it's able to break above there. And these advanced decline lines also break higher it would be really difficult for me to be anything but pretty bullish and, and constructive about uh, the S&P from there because that is that is a market firing on all cylinders and getting the confirmation down the cap tiers we haven't had quite yet. Until then, I see it as, as a bit of a lack of confirmation there. This is a really interesting chart, which is the uh, advancers decliners every day. Uh, at the close, we'll refresh the chart. It was about 80% advancers uh, when I looked earlier. It's about, it's about 81%, it looks like, uh, finishing higher on the day. So Yesterday, so this was the election uh, day, uh, Tuesday, we had the elections overnight, pretty volatile uh, period for the futures. Yesterday was a gap higher and a nice follow through to the upside. We closed the day about 50% of the way up. What was interesting though is only about 55, 50, 55% 55 of, uh, of the uh, New York Stock Exchange closed higher yesterday. So while the market was significantly higher, it was, it was about half the stocks that actually closed higher, which means on a big up day, half of the market was down, actually closed lower, which is not a feel good, everything's rosy, the market's uh, stepping on the accelerator type of day. That's more like a weaker breadth, not a lot of support, narrow leadership, but the market's still up, you know, despite that. Today was sort of the opposite. Today you had a continued up move, follow through from yesterday, but eight, you know, four out of five stocks finished, uh, finished higher on the day. So the characteristics of yesterday's up move versus today's up move were very, very different. And I would argue a day like today is a nice follow through suggesting that uh, there's broader participation, at least in one day, uh, again, the cumulative advanced decline lines start to take that over time and look at a cumulative version of that. I should note that the advanced decline lines we looked at up here aren't updated for today's close just yet. Those, those will update in a little bit, and we'll see, uh, see if, they, uh, if they get the follow-through or, uh, or not. Let's continue this, uh, this look uh, further on. Uh, let's go to this one. This is looking at uh, percent of stocks above their 200-day and above their 50-day. We're looking at the S&P 500 as a universe here. Um, you can see as of yesterday's close, 71% of the S&P were above their 200-day moving average. That's remained pretty constructive. This is an important indicator when we do have a pullback. And so on these pullback uh, legs where we've come down in September, we came down in mid to late October. This is a chart I use because as long as this remains above 50%, 
it's in line with previous you know, sort of pullbacks within a constructive longer term uptrend, sort of a, you know, viable pullback, quote unquote, within a longer term uptrend. And that's what these last pullbacks sort of lined up on. If we would sell off again, this would be the line to watch 50% and see if we're able to remain above there. Back above 50% in terms of the percent above their 50 day moving average. So it tells you that stocks are regaining their 50 day, just like the S&P was able to do. I would imagine this would continue to go higher when we updated for today's close. What's interesting is as the S&P keeps trying to push higher, do you get enough of a follow through? Do you get a breakout in this indicator showing you that more and more stocks are improving? It's been sort of less and less on these last couple uh, upswings, which may be a bit of a, of, of a concern. Here we're looking at the percent above their 200 day for the S&P at the bottom, but also for the New York Stock Exchange, it's a little broader universe. Here at 61%, which is still again above half, which is good. Uh, and, and so you'd want to see both of those remain above 50% on any sort of uh, pullback. The new highs uh, are an interesting uh, basket to look at. Uh, as of yesterday, we had 49 uh, new highs on the S&Ps. So that's 10% of the S&P making a new 50 week high uh, yesterday. Not updated yet for today, so we'll see what sort of uh, update we get on here. But you can see the increasing number of new highs that you had here in early October. That's what was missing uh, before. And my thought was, you know, really you want to see, it, you know, if and when we break above S&P 3600 or, or approach those levels, you want to see this line going up because as it tells you is, is even before the S&P is able to break out, you need to have individual stocks that are really starting to follow through to the upside. And that's uh, one of the key things to look at. We've talked about bullish percents. So I don't want to beat that one too much. Uh, I do want to get down because we're out of time. I do want to get down here. McClellan Oscillator Summation Index. I hope I put the Zweig Breadth Index. There we go. I was going to say, I knew it was here somewhere. This is an index. We'll, we'll finish this up. When we're talking about breadth, this is the Mar Marty Zweig's uh, Breadth Thrust uh, Indicator. And this is essentially when uh, it's using a 10-day exponential average of advancers over total stocks. And this is an indicator he popularized uh, and, and others have followed through on, uh, on some of his work. But, you know, long story short, we went below 0.4, low, uh, below 40%. Uh, you need to get above 0.61% within 10 trading days. We're getting very, very close to that. Uh, be very interested to see if we're able to follow through on that because what that would tell you is there is such a breadth thrust or such a participation here that usually uh, means much further upside from there. It's a pretty healthy signal. We haven't had that sort of signal in quite a while. It's actually pretty rare that that whole thing plays out because you have to have very weak breadth that rotates very quickly to very positive breadth. That is what we're very close to seeing. And that's a chart I'll be following over the next uh, couple of days or so. And again, it's not quite updated for today in terms of the, the total reading, but looks like it's about 0.58. So not quite at a buy signal yet, but, uh, but pretty close. And that would signal a high percent or high probability for further upside from here. We need to wrap the show and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. We'll get to them uh, as quickly as we can. Here we go. Chart number one is looking at the S&P and the percent of advancers decliners. As I mentioned, if you want to think about the last 48 hours from a technical perspective, I think you have an example of a weaker breadth upswing and a stronger breadth upswing. And what's good for all of us is we finished with the second one. You know, yesterday's trading was more of a narrow lead rally. It was the FANG trade working again, but things like materials, industrials actually backed down. It was healthcare and tech at the top of the list. And a lot of things actually were down on the day. Today was the opposite. Almost all of the 11 S&P sectors finished up on the day. You had 80%, 81% advancers as opposed to 55%. That's a much broader uh, upswing. And it tells you that uh, there's participation. It tells you, you know, a string of those is very encouraging uh, for long-term strength. Chart number two is looking at new highs and new lows. And as this uptrend, this little cyclical up move continues, as we near previous highs, you'd want to see uh, the number of new 52 week highs on the S&P for sure starting to increase because I will tell you that names are already able to break to new swing highs, able to push above their own 52 week highs. And uh, the more of those that happen, the more likely the S&P is able to finish and uh, follow through to the upside. Finally, I've been trying to just finish the show with one name at a, at a key point. If you question uh, the sanity of using things like moving averages, Fibonacci retracements, Papa John's is a perfect illustration of how you can combine those two. If you take the low in March, you take the peak in September, it pulled back literally to the 38.2% line, which was also pretty much right where the 200-day moving average was. It has bounced back above there, which all else being equal tells you it's a pretty decent entry point within a long-term uptrend. It's up pretty good today, but overall tells you there's potential for further upside. If and when you pull back a break below that support level, which is the previous lows and the Fibonacci support, 
would suggest further downside risk. Folks, that is our show for today. I want to thank Mark Ungerwitter from Charter Trust joining us from New Hampshire today, sharing his thoughts on the long-term breadth characteristics. Please get your questions in. Shoot us an email. Tag us on Twitter. We'd love to answer your question on the air tomorrow. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.